Okay, so unfortunately, I've actually read a lot of this beforehand, so it's not like pure, just reactionary, but it's still good to have like thoughts about it. Okay. Um, so those who don't know, Overwatch uh, 2 development team did a AMA on Reddit. <clears throat> and for those who don't know, we actually had like a brief, as content creators, a brief... Um, I don't know why I want to call it Q&A. It's not really a Q&A. We get to like talk about some stuff, but also ask some questions um, ourselves. So, you know, they're making a good, a good faith outreach asking for feed. I wouldn't, I don't know if it's like asking for feedback or at least offering insight to like what they're doing, which is good. Um, so this was Jeff Goodman and Noah. Uh, Josh Noah? I don't know if it's Josh Noah. I don't want to, I don't want to fuck up his first name. What's Josh or Okay, I'm just gonna do it. Um Oh it's Josh? Okay, cool. So there was there's the other Josh and like I was like, are they both Josh? My brain my brain works weird. Anyways, um so let's see. First question Do you foresee any heroes changing roles or would you like to keep everyone where they are? Now this is an interesting one. This is something we've been experimenting with and talking a lot about. No hero has moved roles yet though. Because some people used to talk about May. We've started testing Doomfist as a tank, as previously mentioned. Um, I should have these in order, but it's fine. It's whatever. Doomfist kit is full of crowd control effects and mobility, which makes it difficult to tune and balance him as a DPS in Overwatch 2. As a tank, though, he can keep those key properties to his kit since... They can fit nicely into the tank role, mostly the crowd control stuff. I'll finish it first. Of course, this means he'll be losing some damage and gaining some defenses. This is still being tested and iterated on, so I don't have a ton of details on it yet, as it's still in the early stages. Some of the early feedback so far is that he's not really feeling like a tank without having at least one of his active defense button his defense but or his main defenses are passive at the moment so that's something we'll probably try next so let me get this straight doom as a tank like on the most basic level is he hitting the gym because like think about all the tanks in the game right other than maybe Zarya, like, they're all huge in comparison, right? Like, Doofus is bigger than the average Squishy, but I feel like you have to, like, Mario size him, which is, first off, funny as shit. Um, but I would wonder, you would definitely need some type of defensive, but what could that be? What could that be? Hmm. Well, it's not really up to me to, to design exact mechanics, but... New mechanic in Overwatch 2, Magic Mon... <laughs> I mean, in a way, though, it really is. It really is kind of like a Magic Mushroom thing where, like, you know, you'd have to make him bigger so he takes, you know, takes up more space. That's just always been the tank, you know, the tank way. But this is interesting, though. This is very interesting. Because everyone's always considered May as the possibility of swapping from the DPS role to a tank role. But I think that's mostly has to do with her ability to control space and, you know, wall and self heal and stuff like that. Those are tank qualities, well as CC and low damage. But Doomfist doesn't really jump right out as a tank, but it also makes sense um, considering his kit. Now, you'd have to be really careful, I think, with, you know... Things like punch and, you know, I don't think anything could, I could think of as scarier than a tank Doomfist eating off a rooftop, to be honest with you. That's kind of a terrifying thought. So you may have to change how mobile he is if you're making him more defensive. Because um, if past heroes have showed us anything, is mobile defensive heroes are really strong, like D.Va. You know, um, the reason I say Diva's more defensive than offensive, even though Diva's 
played offensively is just because her defense matrix is more protective. Her burst damage and her micro missiles isn't really that strong. Like it's good against squishies, but in, like in a tank battle, it's not that strong. Um, it's like it's very it's more defensive than offensive. So I would be curious. I'd be really curious. But you know what this this does say to me though is some of those more I guess unfun heroes to play against are being swapped. Right? Like, think, or at least being changed. Because if we think about it this way, what are some of the unfun heroes to play against right now? For support players, a lot of them say Doom. Even if Doom's really not that strong right now. Just unfun to play against. When when Doom is good, Doom isn't fun to play against. Orisa. When Orisa is good, Orisa's unfun to play against. Sigma kind of goes hand in hand with Orisa. Even though it's much less, it's still like, it's still in that ballpark. Uh... Genji, uh, nah, I disagree on that. Genji, Genji's not that unfun to play against. I, I think that's just, I think that's a very lack of understanding Overwatch take. Because Doomfist, Doomfist actually sucks to play against because typically, when Doomfist was meta, um, shining in a white floor. It's, it's sunlight. It's sunlight. I only have my windows open like this much. Um. What was I saying? Oh, yeah, anyways. Doofus is really strong when he's meta because, like, things like Zarya Bubble. Uh, like, so the way I always think about this is King's Row. On King's Row attack, right, you have the statue, the building, and then defense and offense. Offense of Doofus just goes up, gets bubbled, goes in, or, I'm, or more or less comes off the top, bubbled, he's in, uppercuts, uh, fucking a certain target. They sleep, try to sleep him, but the bubble saves him, executes the support, and then gets out. You know, at the worst, it's a trade. At the best, you trade for a support, and that's a W. And that's not fun to play against that. There's no really counterplay on the Ana and the support player part. So changing that is actually really good. Um, I'm interested to see how he gets changed and if it's going to be good or not. Um, but what this says to me more than anything is not only are we looking at things... That are OP, but things that are not fun to play against, which is good. Sombra's kind of scares me, but everything else, though, everything else at least shows promise. I just hope this isn't, you know, like a Sombra where, I mean, you know, you just you just start one tapping things on cooldown or just making their life difficult. But hey, that's not the point. The point is, that's a good thing. That's a good thing that they're looking at it. So we'll see. Doofus tank? Question mark. Were ultimate generation rates lower than in the live game? Okay, I already know what the answer to this is before even reading this, but it, this is this is a good point. I felt like there were less ults in general, although this might be due to one less player and 25% less ult charge from tanks. I'm not sure what they mean by 25% less ult charge from tanks. I, I don't think they understood the 25% ult charge to support change, but apparently that might that might not be coming to live anyways. That They might be getting rid of that. The biggest change here is the less ult gain from tanks. We haven't actually modified an ultimate cost outside of this change in the implicit 5v5 changes, obviously. Having ults happen less often was something we were, or were targeting early on. Yes, especially support ults. And this tank change largely accomplished this by itself. This is something that's super easy to iterate on, though, and I'm sure we'll be tweaking it throughout the game's development slash beta. So this is actually really important. Um... On current patch Overwatch, support ults run the game on every level. Bap window, nano, rally, and zen. Uh, zen trank are the four that jump out to me immediately. Valk and beat aren't really that good. Um, but those ults are what dictate fights. When you have window on double shield versus double shield, you turn the corner, pop window, you immediately win the fight. Like... On a defensive team, you have to realize that window's coming and get ready to play, like, you know, stuff's honest. Um, for example, with Nano, Winston's can't even jump in anymore without Nano. It doesn't work. Um, it's not possible because of the way Brig exists. Um, and even without Brig, having one or two different types of CC, you'd still blow them up very easily. So... Support ults, less ults in general is good. Less support ults is very good. Um, but overall, though, 
Um, less ults obviously makes sense because having one less tank. Most people who farm ults off the tanks, both supports and DPS on the opposite side. Just always how the game has been. So, I wonder, my question is, will ultimates then become stronger? Not only in use, but like, will that open up the idea that a stronger ult is good? Um, for example, on Mercy, do they expand Valk past where it is? Because it's pretty weak um, in its current state. And where I think it thrives the most is not in a brawly state sense, sense, but like, say, double shield versus double shield. Um, being able to have everybody kind of clumped up and give them all damage boost is pretty valuable. Um, but that's very niche and acceptance uh, niche way and that's not really how mercy was originally good so she's like kind of fallen behind in a lot of ways but the recent uh movement buff made her almost impossible to kill so i don't know well i this is more of an ultimate conversation or anything but uh i wonder if this will make ults or open up the idea that making ults stronger maybe we see rhine shatter turn back to three seconds i think that's something that should absolutely be back in overwatch 2 especially with making ults feel impactful and having less follow-up. Because Ryan, it's almost impossible to to kill a target with a 2.5 second. Because it used to be swing, swing, fire strike. Um, now you can't complete the combo. It's too slow. Um, I mean, I, I'm for, personally for one that I think that 3 second shatter should be back on the live game. Because of the way they changed Sigma. Honestly, you could beat Rush. And this is from him from somebody who used to play um, Ryan back... I can, I can show you guys really quick. I played Ryan when Double Shield was a thing. Back in, like, season 18. 17 was the first season. Roll Q comes out. Double Shield's at strongest, but I still played a lot of Ryan. Played a bunch of Ryan solo Q. A lot of Ryan solo Q. A lot of Ryan solo Q. Solo... Oh, actually, this is when me and Ewong, I think, started to do. Right around this time. But I played a lot of Ryan against Double Shield. Um, because of sh three second Shatter... You could get through the two shields and still win a team fight, and especially with the Sigma change to 1.5 um, on his shield deploy. If you see a Sigma put up his shield and you get through and you hit that shatter, it's very impactful, um, just as the Rhine. So I think that maybe that's something we look at coming back to Overwatch 2, um, having more impactful ults all the way around, but I'm kind of ranting at this point. Okay. Was there any feedback from the pros playing the playtest? What did you didn't expect? Um... Is there any that you're already planning on acting on? Finally, there's a bit of talk about Zarya Bubble. Cooldown or Rush 2 exists now. Has there any talk of potential changes to this as a sync cooldown for each bubble? This is a very, very good question. Yes, uh, we had a good mix of things we expected and things we didn't expect. Probably the biggest surprise for me was just how good we thought Sombra was in this iteration. Okay, let's talk about this really quick. Like, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That Sombra from me, as a player, looked at it and went, this is the most broken thing I've ever seen. Um... And I think that's why it's very important that we continue to start having conversations with the team, uh, both from content creators as well as pro players. Because pro players know better than content creators, but we're also not idiots either. You know, like we might not be the top level player and, and scrims and, and professional matches work differently than ladder. That's true. But someone like Emong, for example, who plays 10 hours a day every single day, probably knows the game in and out like better than almost anybody, you know. Um, so being able to look at that and being like, what, being able to s figure out where the problems lie is much more, um, applicable, I would say, with experience than by data. Because the data, and I'm sure looking at the numbers of it, it doesn't look that strong, like the damage isn't that high. Even EMP, like, it's impactful, which is good. It's an impactful, as we're talking up here, having more impactful ults, but without feeling like unplayable because it's only one second cc instead of eight seconds or six or eight seconds which whatever hack is so it doesn't feel unfun to play against um however though as players we look at that and go yeah no absolutely not like you're just gonna be deleting supports and harassing them the entire game and we when we watched which if you haven't watched the other video on my youtube this one uh right here where we watched um we watched Super's POV and we watched the Dorado game. We watched New York, or Dorado and Havana and then we watched Super's POV. Um, we saw like, I think 
Hanbin got got hacked three times out of spawn. Like, walked out of the spawn room before the first 12 seconds was already hacked three times. Like, invisible uh, hack while well, invisible is just like that is just unacceptable, in my opinion. But, um, but again, this is why it's important to start having these conversations together and being able to, like, talk about, like, not only is it something broken or not fun to play against, but also fun to play and also make it valuable. And, like, together... Because none of us are developers. We don't know everything. We just, we're just players. So, like, we have input, but, like, we're not going to be right on everything. So, it's it's good that those conversations are starting to happen. And that is the most important thing of all from this question, I think. But, moving on. We've been playtesting those changes at least for weeks, a few weeks, and we felt she was strong, but never felt like she was taking over games or anything. Which is fair. Obviously, when you get her in the hands of pros with amazing game sense of coordination, it makes confirming kills a lot easier. We have since focused her a bit on her numbers and tweaked her down a bit uh, to keep her under control while still allowing her to play a new kit well. This is kind of what I mean by why the pros are better than us, like, regular content creators. Um, and it's why metas develop so heavily, is they realize ways very quickly, um, whether it's based off of prior experience, etc., to abuse a hero to its full effect faster than the average gamer or even the average high-level player, you know? I can't even tell you how many times the meta swapped without balance patches even happening just because pros figured out what was the strongest, you know? Um, and it's why I think that when they nerfed uh, Ryan Health and Baptiste healing at the same time, it was going to kill Rush into the ground because if you nerf both of them at the same time, when if you nerfed just Bap healing, you would still make it, like, viable, just not as strong. Um... You, you you kind of offset the balance on that one. And I think that this is kind of like a, a good example. It's like in playing and testing, it felt okay. But like once, you know, enough like better players that are better than even better than I am, you know, um, you know, pick up on it. It'll be uh, good. I was going to talk about Zarya Bubble cooldown on Watch 2 and it exists now. Has there been any talks of potential changes to this as a sync cooldown for each bubble? I think there's a good amount of iteration to still be done with Zarya. I think Josh already touched on some Zarya stuff in another thread. But I would definitely say she is set not set in stone. She was always going to be a bit tricky to tweak with 5v5 environment. I'm sure she'll see more changes over time. I actually... I'm of the opinion that Zarya is going to be impossible to balance. That's... I that's what I think. I think she needs to be completely reworked because from what I've seen of Zarya, she looks by far the worst tank. Like not even close. Both by, you know, her utility and her ability to get charge. Like uh, you know what I mean? Like the biggest way Zarya always got charged was either bubbling teammates that are in absolute danger or tanks. Especially like the other Ryan that swings on people, you know? Like Ryan v Ryan swinging on each other, you just get a lot, you know? So, tough to say, but I think Zarya is in deep trouble. <clears throat> and that's not their fault. That's just the hero. What is your philosophy on how tank busts are heroes such as Reaper? Okay. All right. This is definitely a, a, this is someone who watches my stream. 100%. I, I refuse to believe it because they... Ah, this is like my question. What is your philosophy on how tank busts are heroes such as Reaper, Echo, and Hanzo, and more should be approached or rushed to? Is the role tank buster obsolete? When there's only one tank. I think it's important to have a concept of these high damage output heroes. Disagree. Which each have their own imitations and trade-offs. Though not necessarily to fill the role of specifically taking out tanks and barriers. This is especially true with the format change to one tank per team in 5v5. Because it can give players more options to respond to in a variety of challenges. That may be taken to overcome in-game more... In wait. Overcome in-game. More depth of team comms can lead to deeper gameplay. We have taken some tuning steps to make abilities like Storm Arrow and Echo Beam less lethal against tanks, but still keep them powerful in, in other solutions. Um, so I've seen some of those changes. Now, I don't know if they're all the ones that I've seen are set in stone, but both of these are absolutely way too fucking strong still. Like, way too motherfucking strong. Listen, this is my this is my take. This is my take for this. The philosophy of tank buster should be gone in Overwatch 2. Absolutely. I actually think that almost all one shots should be gone. Almost. Not all, but almost. Because heroes like Widow are going to be menaces. 
menaces on the battlefield. Um, and Hanzo as well. Hanzo's actually just maybe even a scarier widow because Hanzo's a tank buster at his core. If you're not the best Hanzo, even a decent one, how do you get good at Hanzo? You walk up to the choke. You fire your first arrow, full full charge. Maybe with a recon on it. And then dump the storm arrow immediately into their shield. Just as fast as you can. Because then that immediately triggers its cooldown. And you'll have it again in 8 seconds. Guess what happens in 8 seconds? Their shields are gone. Then you have a free another storm arrow. Storm arrow of headshots. You like Never mind even headshots. Even body shots. You're deleting large heroes. Like tanks especially. You delete them. Never mind a hero like Echo. Which Echo does extremely high amounts of damage with both her left click and right click. Not right click doesn't do a lot to shield. I think right click's just you know right click's much more of an on damage here uh, ability. Left click is much more shield break. And let's not get started on Echo Beam. You know we saw I saw um, from the play tests. And if you haven't seen, I think Super had a stream. I don't know if he made it a YouTube video or anything like that when he reviewed. His gameplay from it, he said that Echo just it's just, it just runs the lobby. Echo runs the entire a good Echo runs the whole Overwatch 2 lobby because one, not only can she copy a tank and copy another hero to bring her life back and have quick ultimates just like she already has, she just deletes tanks, you know, just deletes them still. And getting that trade, even if Echo died, getting the trade of one DPS for the single tank, you're gonna win the you're gonna win fights like 80% of the time. Trading the Echo for a, a, a tank is is more than well enough. And that's assuming the Echo dies. So heroes like these, I think, absolutely, the philosophy should be fizzled out. Now, I don't know what you would do with a hero like Reaper. To be honest with you, I'm okay with Reaper staying because Reaper's the original tank buster. Um, but he had a major trade-off of having to get, like, up fucking close, you know? And old Reaper used to have the life uh, the lifesteal orbs. And so you had to confirm kills to heal back up. Reaper now, as you fight him, you have to you have to decide. Are you going to be able to kill him faster than he can kill you? And if the answer is no, you have to run. And so on heroes, especially like Ryan or uh, Winston or Diva or etc., like you end up actually running away from the Reaper much more and like trying to get help, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. But at least Reaper has to chase you into a team and play like ultra aggressive. Hanzo and Echo do not need to do this. Echo has to get close for her beam, but at that point she already knows you're low. You know? If the Echo fucks up and doesn't understand like how to use her beam, that's on the Echo. But like if the Echo gets you under 200 HP, etc., and she flies into you, she knows she has you. You're dead. The only thing saving you is like if you've been in a good position, you've been calling out for help the entire time. And if you watch any streams that happen on a daily basis on a current patch Overwatch, especially any Emong, all he does is goes, oh, I died to an Echo Beam, you know, like half the time. Like as a player, it's not fun to play against. As a tank player, it's not fun to play against. Tank busting, in my opinion, should be just gone. Wait, that's funny. Wait, I just read that. Thank you, Flats, huh? Glad this got asked. Wait, what? Wait, does this guy think that's me? Wait. Wait. <laughs> Wait, what? Is there more? Oh, I don't know what that did, but okay. Um... Also, I'm used to old Reddit. This is new Reddit, and I don't, I haven't, I haven't been on new Reddit in like years. <clears throat> no, he thanks you as the one he, that asked first on stream. Yeah, I'm gonna just move on. I think I understand what you guys are saying, but that's funny. Um, this is exact. This is literally my exact question. So, right, that's a flat sub right there. I see you looking out. I see you looking out. Shout out to Happy Shala Days. Okay, moving on. The change of 5v5 will, of course, require hero changes across the board, but I'm primarily interested as to know how you're going to be looking at supports. 
uh, with them having one less tank to heal and one less tank to protect them. Uh, no offense, this looks like lower. This is probably like plat below. Um, how are you tweaking supports in the new game? Because like that's not actually how tanks work. Uh, and I think Jeff actually kind of says that. So far, broadly speaking, we found that supports are often more safe in a 5v5 environment. This is true, I think, except Sombra. I think Sombra is the, the is the X factor to this, but this is this makes sense. Because there's one less tank trying to dive them and take them out, correct? There are instances where this isn't true, like Sombra and her rework trying to assassinate them or being sniped easier without a lot of barriers to hide behind. This is why I think snipers is going to be a big problem to balance in this game. It's going to be tough. Uh, in those situations, sometimes it's a matter of trying to position more carefully or maybe Sombra trying to being a bit too OP right now. Good one, Jeff. Initially, we have worried that supports without mobility to try to escape might be weak in this environment, but so far we've actually seen Zen Ana being very strong. Because <coughs> Zen is broken! <clears throat> oh, something in my throat. Being very strong instead of weak because of the nature of their offensive abilities in a 5v5 environment. So, this is true. Um, supports are definitely going to get less ult charge, which is a good thing, but to be honest with you, uh, I would, they're going to be much more offensive, which is why I wonder what they're going to do with a hero like Mercy. Um, heroes that don't really have much offensive pressure as well as defensive pressure. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. But as Zen is just fucking busted. Um, Titan, but the, the philosophy behind tanks protecting is very flawed other than D.Va. Um, D.Va is the only example of a very defensive tank. Um, that tries to peel more than anything. Otherwise, Zarya bubbles are typically used to make plays. If you have to use a bubble to save somebody, it's typically a bad thing, unless they get anti'd, then, and that's typically your main tank that gets anti'd, um, just because they're using all the abilities on them, so that's different. But, like, if you have to turn around and bubble someone behind you, that's typically, like, you, you're losing the fight. Um, they're usually used better proactively, so... They will be safer because there's less tanks pressuring them, but they're also going to have to be more viable or more concerned with their positioning because they're going to take more poke damage from DPS that they normally wouldn't take. Okay, thanks for doing this again, which, by the way, again, let me reiterate, this is a very positive thing, not only for Reddit, um, but for doing it with Overwatch League and doing it for content creators. It's very appreciated. I'm not a very competitive player, but I'm curious to know if the playtest included any changes that were directly made in consideration of Overwatch 2's new heroes and how they might affect PvP. Okay, let me read, read that one more time. I'm not a very competitive player, but I'm curious to know if the playtest included any changes that were directly made in consideration of Overwatch 2's new heroes. Oh, so like new hero releases. Okay. For instance, altering one of the current heroes in a way that compensates for a new counter that might have, etc. No details, of course, but a layer... Yes or no question. I can't give any specific details, but the answer is yes. There aren't too many instances of this, but it also in some cases, there are... That's like slipped up somehow. It just got off kilter. It just kind of freaked me out. Um, I'm going to change yet those playtest builds because of the new mechanics interactions with unreleased or reworked heroes. This is still very rare though, because... Even though Overwatch is always a game of checks and balances, there has to be a limit. You can't have hard counters to heroes because those make those heroes unfun to play against. For example, Brig. Brig was a hard counter to Tracer, right? Like a very unskilled Brig player could kill the best Tracer player just by picking Brig because you just bash, swing, boop, right? Bing. Soft counters are good, though. You know, like, when p teams play, play like, Sim Junk playing Pharah, that's a soft counter. Um, playing Somber against Zen, that's a soft counter. Um, uh, what's, what's another good example? Uh, playing Hanzo or Echo against Double Shield, that's a soft counter, you know? Um, those are things that, like, actively fight against it very hard. Diva versus Mercy? I wouldn't say Diva's a hard counter to Mercy or a soft counter to Mercy. Diva's more of a soft counter to 
Um, spam hero is like junk or Farah, but not a hard counter. That's very much just like a like a supporting soft carrot. Uh, uh, you know, Zarya versus Diva, I guess. Yeah, another soft. But Zarya, actually, the Zarya Diva interaction has changed so much with since the Rhine changes and the changes overall in the game. Ryan Diva is actually better than Ryan Zarya at this point by like a lot, but like let's not get into that. Um, how did the Bastion rework perform in these play tests compared to your expectations? It's funny, I actually tried to throw him some buffs right before the build went out, but I missed the deadline slightly. He's been tr pretty tricky to tune with his rework, but it was great to see him play tested by these great players. I feel like his design is solid, but is really just a matter of getting his numbers into a good place now. Agreed. Also, the other thing is, um, I think Super said this, is he feels very clunky. Like, the left click feels very clunky to, to play. Like, it just doesn't feel good, and it doesn't, like, play well. Uh, since this playtest, we buffed him in a number of ways. He moves faster in sentry mode. He, his ult starts dropping faster through the projectile, moves slower, so you can see it a bit more. His recon fire rate has been increased in other buffs. Uh, yeah, which is like the DMR, which a lot of people, which people said that it felt clunky. The trickiest thing, thing, thing is, though, is when playing him, you feel like you're getting thrashed pretty hard because he is such a large hero. He is very easy to target and hit with everything, especially when he gets discorded, etc. But that's because Discord is... There's a lot we can tweak as with that as well, such as increasing his passive, ironclad, and offer more protection while he's transformed. We also have a new tuning knobs to help control his sentry mode, since it now has a cooldown and duration associated with it. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Many pros involved in the, in the match described Zarya as a particularly weak in the tank lineup. Some even suggested it felt like it was nerfed with buttable cooldowns. Do you plan to adjust reworker based on that feedback? Oh, this is the one that was referenced earlier. This is an interesting one we're keeping an eye on since internally the resounding feedback has been that Zarya is far in the other direction and many think she is too strong and constantly high energy being able to bubble herself twice. Uh, how? Uh, I, I don't mean to be, you know... Uh, I don't even see how she's even getting energy, to be honest with you. Um, I, I don't even know how she's even going to get to high charge. I would, if anything, you should probably... I would, if my suggestion would be to make her charge much easier to acquire... Um, but her damage numbers are changed very much. Like, if she's at high energy, the damage ceiling is much lower. But she's at low energy, the skill floor or the damage floor is much higher. So, like, it's still impactful, but not, like, if you have no energy, you're just a fucking wet noodle fucking flopping around. But if it's high energy, you're just, just gunning things down. Like, maybe just, like, make it, like, a middle ground somewhere so she's still impactful. Because I do not, like, I, I, I obviously haven't seen the internal play tests of course but like knowing what i know and watching what i've seen like i i almost think it's impossible that's and that's not their fault it's just nature of the hero there's a couple details that get overlooked with this new shared cooldown setup that the duration of the barriers has been extended slightly yeah but that doesn't really matter we sent it we started at three seconds and it's gone down to 2.5 and the cooldown timer starts ticking immediately unlike on live where the barrier has to be destroyed but here's the thing though, on live right now, on live right now, people will blow up bubble if they know they can kill the target. In 5v5, I don't think there's that same level of pressure unless it's like on a tank that's low, you know? But then that's the same way that Zarya has always worked. Like it's only Zarya. Like if they know they can blow up just the Zarya, then they'll they'll kill her, you know? But yeah, like let's say it's like a like a support or something that's like half HP and she bubbles in and they're like they were gonna go for the kill. If they know that they can't kill her. A lot of players will just stop shooting at it, you know, because they know they can't get they can't break it by themselves. It's kind of like your brain has to turn off to keep shooting it, you know, like you'll keep shooting it if you're confident you're going to get through it. But if you if you players start to know and develop the, the understanding that they will almost never break that bubble, they won't shoot it. And so she will stay almost eternally low charge unless somebody fucks up. And that's what I think is the big problem. So the barriers and broken your cooldowns coming up quicker. Now live by the same amount of time. The current internal cooldown is nine seconds, but it's easy to tune that lower if she isn't performing well. But at some point, it breaks down, and too many of those barriers get quickly annoying to play against. Yes, 100%. Um, the flexibility to bury yourself twice in succession or an ally twice is also a power of utility in itself. 
both barriers are yeah but that, that's the same thing though it's like if, if, if somebody is low and they they realize that even if they break the bubble they'll get bubbled again they just won't shoot the bubble you know what i mean like they will just disengage or they'll realize that they're not going to get this kill you know unless everybody's focusing it that's going to be tough you know um their players did anything they have many different levels of internal play tests though they have like lower level higher level etc so like you can't even though I, like, I don't disagree and to be honest with you when i watched the original six months ago at blizzcon i was not impressed as most people know um even in like a small place in my heart i still think 66 is better in my opinion but i understand everything that's happening and i'd rather be more helpful than against it because i know there's no turning back but regardless though that's not really the point uh the point is to your question is is uh, there are different levels of playtests. Like, they do have high-level players and lower-level players. So, we, went, we we watched, most likely, lower-level players. The flexibility to, to bury yourself twice in succession or an ally twice is so also powerful. Utility in itself, using both barriers at the same time, is the worst-case scenario for cooldown management, but sometimes necessary. But that's not totally true, in my opinion. That's kind of, that's kind of like, no, like, I mean, no disrespect, but kind of a cop-out. Um, because bubbling yourself twice is like an emergency situation to keep yourself alive, but that keeps yourself alive. And if they kept shooting at you, that's an 80 charge kept alive, you know, like, yeah, you don't have bubbles anymore to be aggressive, but that's not really the point. Unless they have like a high damage sniper, like, you know, even against like soldier or something <clears throat> soldier, like your damage over time, isn't going to be enough. Even like say something like Dorado choke. Dorado Choke, you could probably walk through that while getting heals and getting shot at and make it through on Zarya with no bubbles, especially if you have that high charge, or you're going to end up winning the poke battle, especially against, like, non-shields. Like, if you play against, like, a Hog, Diva, uh, an opposing Zarya, etc., that that high charge and for changing for cooldowns is no different than live. Like, you'll, char you'll change... You'll use both your bubbles on live to get 80 charge in the beginning of a fight almost no problem, because both Zaryas will do, do it most likely. And if you don't, then... You saved your cooldown, but you're much less effective. So, I don't totally agree with that. Um, just referencing another one. This is a good one. We heard new sound effects for friendly team deaths. Any other audio improvements you've discovered or played around with is this communication wheel the same as with Overwatch 1? Uh, so, they said that... Um, no one from the sound design team is here today, which is which is fine. But the important thing is, though, is they are implementing the free, the team death sounds, which I think is awesome because that helps you keep track of your teammates being alive or not. Um, and I wonder what else. I wonder if there's going to be a ping system. I wonder if there's going to be um, different ways to communicate in game uh, based off sound, not just visual, um, because sound is very, very important um, in Overwatch. Uh, and it's very good compared to a lot of games. You know, some things are not totally there. Like, sometimes it's hard to hear certain things. And honestly, I think that my, like, low-key hot take is you should count things like Zen and Sigma having a pat. Like, it should be written in their notes on their hero description that they have a passive, that they have no footsteps. Um, Because especially in Overwatch 2, where I think flanking is going to be very strong, um having no footsteps is a is a big w uh for any hero so if they ever do decide to add let's say even more dps that don't really touch the ground i know echo doesn't but you know her she still makes like the noise um but like heroes that don't touch the ground i think you should count that as a passive that's my take um are you guys planning to do high on hopium SF shock funny are you guys hoping to do more of these I really liked seeing pro players test the game and then being able to talk about it later definitely helps me understand uh what I was seeing in the gameplay it was really nice to get insight into the actual game from players like super in space I think the community would like more of that as a development team we like tests like this super value or we find tests like this super valuable but we can't commit anything specific however certainly in consideration yes absolutely this is something that should do more of um it might be tougher to do now that the teams are on break um but absolutely absolutely uh, but they know that they know that 
Um, when it comes to how the play tests were run, were there any suggestions slash rules on how slash what players should play? It's a very good question. It seems like players swapped heroes a lot, and I was wondering if they were doing it to be curious or there was a try through heroes or swap every five minutes recommendation to showcase what the difference heroes were like. This is a great question. Reach out to Amy on our T4, uh, Team 4 Owl producer for some insight. We had two rounds of play tests for some players. Four to five teams play tested with their own roster without us providing any rules or suggestions. The players were encouraged to try any role or hero they'd like with no restriction. For the second round, when we were recording, so this is what we watched, we were asked players to stick to their traditional Overwatch League roles and rotate through heroes so the community could see what a wide range of heroes would look like when they played at the highest level. This probably explains Sparkle's barrage at the top of the map. There wasn't any specific try through heroes rule, but we asked to generally switch around and try different comps. That's good to know. Um, because as weird as it sounds, having information like that is kind of important um, after the fact. Because... You know, are you picking heroes because, like, you're just interested in them? Are you picking them because they look right, good here? Are they, like, you know, how how, how high is the, is the meter turned up of, like, trying, you know? Because, like, I'm sure these teams were not full go, 10 out of 10, trying to, like, dominate the other team. You know what I mean? Like, they were trying to have some fun with it. They're trying to enjoy their time getting to play the game, but also see other heroes and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, if that makes a hero, like, I don't know, for example, Soldier... Soldier looked very strong, which I'm good with. Soldier being very strong, why would you swap off Soldier? You know what I mean? Like, what's the point? Well, the point was, play some other stuff, you know? Um, so, it wasn't, like, counter-comping each other, and they weren't trying to, like, beat, like, play better heroes versus each other, and you, it was hard to see, like, the dynamic of how each hero would play against a different one. Um, like, how would Zen Brig play against Sombra? No idea. I don't think we really saw it. But example, though, just, like, you know, it gives us a good idea of, like, how serious, like, the, the knob was turned. <clears throat> are the devs, uh, content, oh, sorry, are the devs content in how tanks performed in the pro play test, slash, how are the play and tests, wait, or how, or how they play in their tests, or is there a possibility of them to get more health? Does it feel like the tanks take damage too quickly? For example, D.Va gets d too quickly, uh, or does it feel like a tank peeks a corner and gets instantly melted? Read this first, and I'll give my take. We certainly still experimenting with many different ways to ensure that tanks are powerful and satisfying to play in this new format. One of those experiments is seeing how far we can push tank base health up before the gameplay starts to break down. Some of the tank's results we've been uh, have been surprising. Diva specifically has ended up much more relatively powerful with only an extra second of defense matrix energy. But she looked so weak in the playtest. So, like, that's why I'm kind of like, huh? She has other changes as well, but one did some heavy lift. But that one did some heavy lifting. Roadhog as well had several experimental buffs along the lines of more damage reduction, resetting hook cooldowns, or even being able to cleanse himself of things like anti heal. Yeah, that's terrifying. They were taken out because he ended up being just two of his own back. Yep. Largely do how viable an early chain hook can be in 5v5. There are still some problematic mechanics we're working to resolve, such as Orb of Discord. Jeff, I'm glad. You heard me. Being nearly always on a tank, an Echo Duplicate's choice coming down to being one of the best on the buffed up tanks. Generally, we haven't found tanks to be getting blown up instantly unless they're hard overextending or aren't working with their team at all. In which case, they should be vulnerable there. But the course, but of course, there we'll have to see how this holds up at a professional level. Um, I mean, from the professional play test, it didn't look like tanks could play very aggressive. You know, especially first point Dorado showed that. Um, defensive side just played the left side room, just AFK'd. Um, and attack, it was really hard to push through, it looked like. So, um, at a pro level or even a high rank level, I think that. Especially things like Discord, especially things like Echo, even even Roadhog himself. Like Roadhog, 
I don't know. I think Roadhog is too strong on live right now. I, I think the game is always in its worst spot when Roadhog is, is, is good. That's my genuine opinion. And I know it doesn't, it's not everyone's favorite opinion, but typically Roadhog play like Roadhog. If Roadhog can beat Rush, typically that's bad because what beats Hog then? Double shield. You run double shield against Hog because you can pull him. You can just abuse him because he doesn't have the ability to use the shield the same way as the double shield. If he beats Rush, well, Rush is the thing that rushes onto him. If he can somehow survive that and tank it long enough or even get picks while you're playing that comp, that makes him too strong because anytime an entire group of people runs onto a single one, they should be able to kill it, but they can't. That says he can survive too hard. That's my opinion. Um... Dive as well, same thing. Dive, dive is the same same thing. If, if he plays well against Dive and Dive can't kill him, that shows that the hero is too strong, my opinion. Um, regardless, though, I actually think Diva looked kind of weak in the format. Um, Diva's very good at one v oneing. Like Diva looked like she could dominate one v ones, but if tanks are getting into one v ones in Overwatch two, then that hero they're one v oneing typically is out of position or they're losing the fight. Um, there almost should never be a 1v1 of a tank versus a DPS or a squishy in, in Overwatch 2. That should almost never happen. Um, unless the other tank dies, which typically means that you're going to lose the fight regardless. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think D.Va, I don't think D.Va looked that strong, but we'll have to see later. Um, but I think Winston's the only tank that looked good. I think Ryan looks like he needs serious motherfucking help because even on current patch, Ryan cannot get close to anything um, without either speed or beneficial map design. Um, changes in Matrix are very powerful. Oh, no, I don't disagree. Th three second Diva defense Matrix is very strong, you know? Um, but like when we watched the play test, that was the same Diva, right? Um... It just, like, 1v1, she looked really strong. But when they were playing Dorado, how she was, like, trying to to contest high ground and contest, like, you know, the choke, it just didn't look very impactful. And that could be one of those things where it's, like, certain maps, certain heroes would be better. Um, like, for Ryan right now, Ryan is very good on, like, certain control maps. Um, double shield dominates 2CP. Uh, hybrid Ryan can be good on certain points. Um, dive can also be very good on, on hybrid on certain points. Escort dive is pretty decent, but so is double shield. Um, so it could be a map dependent type of thing. Um, but specifically for Ryan in 5v5, I'm worried about how far, how close he can get up to people. Um, especially with not having constant speed and especially not having, you know, like, I feel like he would just become like a, a cart bot and like wait for things to come near the cart. When at that point, Ryan doesn't work like that. Ryan's too weak. Especially with 1200 shield. I think Super mentioned that 1200 shield didn't feel very good. But I'm going on way too much of a tangent. Um, I know something I brought up uh, specifically was what I like to explain to people that I think that um, testing new maps and modes lately too, they could impact our perception to some degree. True, true. And especially maps we haven't seen. And I don't know how like New York plays. Um, and I don't know if there's like any reworks of certain maps like Dorado or 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 maps that are too spread like Havana, you know what I mean? Like if there's like reworks of maps and the way those play, that's very different. It's hard for me to to visualize that without seeing it or, or touching it. Um, so you you have a good point there, honestly. Um, but here's my here's my thing. Here's my concern. If Ma okay. If certain tanks don't work in unless they're in like an absolutely very specific situation, they have to dominate that situation. Because if they don't, then if they start to lose their niche, they won't have a niche anymore, and they won't have a reason to be played. Um, Ryan's a good example of that, where when before Ryan got his damage buff and his health buff. Ryan's niche was up close fights. Um, Double Shield took that away because you couldn't even get to up close. 
And then it took it away even further because if you could get close, um, for example, on Lijang Tower, um, night, not Night Market, uh, Control Center, you actually couldn't kill the Orisa. Never mind, make it further. It wasn't possible because she fortify and like she just didn't take any amount of damage and needed to kill her. So he then lost what his niche was, and that's why his pick rate plummeted. Um, and that's what I think most likely caused the the, the big initial Rhine buff. My concern, looking at something like this, is, uh, you know. Are they going to be able to be the, the tank that they are and be aggressive? Or are they more of a passive uh, waiting for 1v1 tool? Because if they, if they can't at least pressure beyond a 1v1, then they're probably not very useful. If they can only dominate the 1v1, then teams have to realize that, that they will lose 1v1s every time. And they will win two v two ones every time, and the tank, the diva will lose the one v one to another tank. That kind of like makes it a weird place. But again, it's hard to say. It's hard to say without having my actual hands on it. So, regardless, though, just like there's like a, and that's what makes tanks so tough. It makes them so tough to like, you know, deal with because unless you have like all the information, it's it's tough to have like a, you know, an even more informed opinion. But hey, listen. Glad that uh, Discord's getting looked at because Discord's very scary, very very scary. All right, I, I lingered long enough on that one. Not bad. What's your plan direction for design balance and support heroes for making sure they are still impactful? I'm sure you still you already know, but there's a lot of people still worried, myself included, about the direction base of balance chases we see in the videos. It seems as you want to move away from healing, considering the 25% healing reduction, but you also nerf the utility with the removal of break stun and cooldown increase on on a sleep dart. Some people have brought up that you may want supports to frag more, but why play a support over a DPS at that point? It's just very confusing. Well, okay, well, first off, they're called supports, not healers. So support's always meant to be both healing and aggression. Is break shield bash just a placeholder for now? The increased damage or no other effect the final product. Okay. It's gonna be a lot one a lot of this one, Jeff. Even the 5v5 environment supports feel much are feeling very imp impactful in many ways. They're actually more impactful than Overwatch 1 currently. That's kind of terrifying because they're very impactful right now. But hopefully they're impactful like with their abilities, not with their ultimates. In the 5v5, there are less damaging going around to both teams compared coupled with the ability to focus heavily onto your single tank. It becomes actually easier for both teams to sustain longer fights. Which leads into the next question. It seems as... Uh, Okay, moving away from healing. There are two parts to this question. Let me break it down. The healing reduction was an attempt at combining, or sorry, combating the first question answer here, which sometimes fights can sustain too long. This is something we actually talked about. And it felt like it was too hard to confirm kills with one less player per team dealing damage. That, and we can't, or we were trying to make uh, poke damage to be more meaningful. This is actually... Wait, and we were trying to make poke damage be more meaningful. I wasn't really impression that they were trying to make it more brawly, but okay. Right now, even in Overwatch 1, sometimes it feels won't feel like shooting an enemy is doing nothing but feeding your enemy or support ultimate charge. Um, that said, we already backed out of this specific change internally, but we have similar goals. I'm, I'm assuming this means like tank poke in the beginning. Um, because typically... In Overwatch One right now, tanks will just feed and and try to get support ult for their for their for their supports because you can't aggress without support ults. Um, so I'm assuming that's what that means because it'll take much longer. Utility nerfs to break stun and a sleep dart are more response than trying to chill out. <laughs> First off, I like this chill out crowd control effects from the in game and less about having them frag more. Or I'm sorry, and less about them having to frag more. Ana's sleep dart is extremely strong, but it's also a great playmaking tool and leads to some sweet highlights and counterplay opportunities. I've seen more videos of Clutch Sleeps on a Flying Pharaoh or Genji ult online than maybe any other support highlight. Okay, that's that's facts. So it's not likely that we'll remove on a Sleep Dart, but other non-tank CCs we've been taking a hard look at and trying to remove them 
the removed CC component and buff it in other ways, which leads to the next question. Um, which, by the way, I think this is a good one about Brig Bash, because Brig Bash looked very clunky, um, not being able to stun. I think it's super clear. All the changes to Brig Bash have gone through from just the video. Uh, some notes on how it was changed. It lost its stun. stun uh, that much was clear. It can go through barriers once again. This removed a while ago in a balance patch to try to address concerns with Brig versus Ryan Orissa. It deals more damage. Once again, this uh, damage was all but removed in a previous balance patch. If I try to remove the stun combo, this is okay. As a okay, this is gonna this is gonna take a long time to remember. It's gonna take a long time to remember that it now goes through shields again. Uh, its damage now triggers Inspire. Initially, I thought this might feel like a minor change, but upon playtesting, I found that to be extremely helpful. You can shield bash enemies to trigger Inspire and move to safety without lowering your shield. It travels much further, almost twice as far. It's much more useful for mobility tool in this version. Super Jump Brig, pause champ. If you if it has a much reduced cooldown, that's it's not really important how much of a cooldown reduction it has right now, as it's likely to change as we iterate on the balance of the game. But what is important is to have a reduced cooldown combined with the ability to travel much further. Makes her generally a lot more mobile so she can escape or be aggressive a lot more easily as needed. That is a lot to fucking break down. That is a lot. Um, First off, I'm not sure about her rally. Does rally still work the same way with gathering armor? Or is it just the overheal now? Like, is it no longer armor? I don't know the answer to that, actually, off the top of my head. Um, It's overhealth? Okay, so that's realistically a major nerf to Brig. That reduces her survivability. Um, which is a good thing because if you're going to buff her ability to move her ability to proc inspire without dropping your shield and whatnot, that actually is like kind of a good change. That's actually kind of a good change. Um, because Brig typically has to make herself in danger to proc inspire, whether that's whip shot, swing, etc. Um, so that's actually like a pretty good thing right there. I actually think, I think whip shot though. I think whip shot's gonna need to get looked at in some way. Because whip shot, okay. For those who haven't seen this, I need to show you this really quick. Don't put it on me. Wasn't that far back. Okay, for those who haven't seen this right here, this is otherwise known as the ultimate main tank pain. Oh. Those who don't, know, don't know, Aspen is an incredibly good player, but this still is kind of ridiculous. I can't tell you the pain that Brig brings. And ever since Brig has existed, dive comp hasn't really worked. It You saw like a little bit in Overwatch League with the absolute like peak comp, like coordination. And when Genji got buffed, you know what I mean? When Genji got buffed, we saw more like Genji and stuff like that for like that like two weeks, which was crazy. But if we're looking at CC in general, okay. I think Brig Whipshot is absolutely something that needs to get looked at as well. 
You can kind of do that with Lucio Boop, though. Do you think that's problematic? No, no, Lucio Boop doesn't have fucking close to the range that that goddamn whip shot does. That whip shot has probably three or four times, I mean, maybe not four, but maybe two to three times as much range as Boop does. And Boop has always been a part of Lucio's kit and works very differently. Um, and, and it's always been tuned. And it used to, like, it used to take ammo to use it. Um, it's been toned down over time. Whipshot can hit you from fucking Narnia. And especially a good Brig. Here's the problem. Lucio has always been designed about being slippery. Okay? Lucio is designed about being slippery and, and hard to get. But he does much less healing. Much lower damage. His... Well, in the past, his ultimate's been worse than Rally. But he gave speed. Brig is more defensive, more tanky. Rally is better. CC on Bash, CC on on Whipshot. Um, and just like... And more health, you know? Or in this case, armor. Um, more armor. Well, I mean, they nerfed it down over time, but that's different. Regardless, though, Lucio Boop, yes, I think works much differently... Uh, but Lucio doesn't have as many tools in his kit. Brig has a fucking entire tool chest full of them, or at least in the past. So, I think that if we are going to look at all of these things, I would probably consider looking at a web shot. Okay, do the roll passes really make sense for a balanced point of view, or are they causing issues? Not just ensuring unique hero identity, but in general game balance. Uh, AG1, I thought I... Wait, I thought that one of the things that was a balance point was a support roster was that Mercy and Zen have a passive self heal, but they can't heal themselves under fire. Now that the supports are able to heal themselves under fire, additional getting, additionally getting a passive self heal is something that's considered. Should Mercy and Zen get a heal uh, themselves while under fire? Mm, I don't know about that. Does it really make sense for here to slow you down, such as May also passively move faster than you? Uh, what about heroes that already move faster? Are they now moving too fast? So far, roll pass has been great. Helped it quite about a lot of balance and hero design in general. That's what I figured. Yes, this is something we talked about and quite a bit with working on these passes. We still want Mercy and Zen to be better at healing themselves, but we're raising the minimum self-heal bar from zero to a small amount as designing support heal heroes. This is a constant question we struggle with in the past, and the roll passive allows for more flexibility. I mean, this this makes perfect sense. Like, let's say they get five HPS while Mercy gets 15. You know what I mean? Like, that makes perfect sense. Like, make them much better at it, and they still have their passive. Beautiful. Currently, the movement bonus that DPS heroes get is very small, but it's still going to be impactful in these kinds of situations that you mentioned. Overwatch is a game that has an insane amount of mobility, so this change is somewhat of a drop in the bucket compared to the, what those heroes can do with their abilities, especially with a hero like Mei, who has no significant other mobility options. We're still very much testing the see what sticks and that needs to be changed or removed. Um, thank you, Andy, Jeff, uh, Josh, and Jody for doing this. We appreciate you guys, and I've been making lately. I'm a fan of the 5v5, uh, and it was a pleasure to see it played on a familiar map type recently, New York. Which, by the way, Dorado, I, 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 have to, I do have to reiterate very quickly, I very much appreciate seeing Havana and Dorado. I hate Havana, and I hate Dorado, but at least seeing it on, like, maps we understand has been good. Is there anything we... Uh, you can say regarding hero releases in the build-up of Overwatch 2 without hurting any timelines or spoiling any reveals. For example, um, okay, you know what? This is asking for new heroes and stuff. Okay, yeah, so oh, there's no point in reading the rest of it. They can't say anything. Um, what was your thought process about hiding any 25% healing reduction in the first four seconds? Well, it's not going to be a thing anymore. Uh, really, that busted in play tests when you tried it. Okay, we'll, we'll do this one really quickly. We found in our internal playtesting is there's generally support heroes that become more impactful, uh, rolled by a wide margin with overall less incoming damage on the field and with a reduction of a tank. Fewer high health pool targets to try and keep up. This has led to the advantage time, or sorry, led to the average time to kill becoming much higher and many fights stalling out longer than we'd like. Interesting, because from the playtest, it didn't really look like that. Um, if anything, the fights looked less chaotic. It looked like um, almost empty. I wouldn't say empty, but emptier in a way. And I think a good example of that was Dorado second. I think for shock. Not only a healing uh, output, but utilities like Mercy Resurrect and Ana Sleep Dart slash Biotic Grenades and Yana Discord, etc. are even more impactful in a 5v5 world. I wonder if you would make Mercy Res her ult. 
but things to consider. Um, the general amount approach was to reduce healing output by the same amount. We don't really know what the amount is on an individual level. A little peek behind the scenes for a game dev. The blanket passive heal reduction over a new concept of being in combat in a, sh a shortcut for us as designers to find an approximate value for what it should be changed by since to adjust the value from playtest to playtest. We only have to change it in one number rather than edit every healing script value individually. The reason for the in combat rule mainly was because we already especially well now we already know from earlier tuning in the Overwatch history when healing is too low, Mercy Zen Lucio specifically, it is annoying to try and deal, or try and heal large health pools from tanks in between fights. Um but Brig Zen is extremely good right now. Um So I would Okay, let me finish this. We've considered adding a bonus heal multiplier to tanks roll passive, but it's also contributed to the issue of fight stalling out as mentioned above. I think having a higher health pool might help with that, but then again, um, I don't know how long those time to kills are. The, the thing about why Zen and Brig is so good right now is because Brig keeps Zen alive and makes sure that he cannot die, and Zen is just an, Zen is supposed to be a glass cannon, right? Zen's supposed to be a glass cannon that does high damage, low heals, uh, and helps out discording targets. However, with Brig, he's now a fortress. Um, it's impossible to die them. It's, just, it's almost impossible to pressure on him. Uh, especially as tank players, uh, it's more of like he just kind of just exists for free. And honestly, in Overwatch, having constant low healing is better than having first small amounts of high healing. Um, whether the Ana gets forced out or or Bap gets forced out, etc. Um, being able to constantly heal at a low amount, and this is why uh, the theory is why AOE heals are so strong why BAP has always been so good, why Moira was really used in Overwatch League, even though she wasn't really used on ladder and she was so strong, um, why Lucio isn't busted right now is because AoE heals, and why Goats was so good with Brig, is AoE heals, providing that low healing over time is much stronger than having no heals, you know? Um, but, Brig, but Zen and Brig, even though they provide low, low healing and it's hard to keep tanks alive, tanks just play more passive, which is boring. Uh, and they just let their supports just basically be a fucking cannon in the back, and then they peel and they play much slower. And it's it feels terrible to play against. So even play with it doesn't feel that good. So it's tough. Um, I'll start the dead things to the tier one, by the way. Appreciate it, dude. So I don't know. I don't know if we can learn something from how Brig Zen works right now on current patch Overwatch, but something to definitely consider. Hi there, as a long-time fan and someone who's been studying the game design, I'm very curious about the design philosophy behind Zarya's adjustments to uh, bubble cooldowns. It absolutely gives players more flexibility in the short term, which I really appreciate, but its implement seems more punishing than in current Overwatch. In current state, you can bubble yourself and an ally and get both cooldowns back around the same period. Uh, be ready for another team fight. From what I've seen in Overwatch 2, these cooldowns now stack, which means that you have the short-term flexibility of either yourself being greedy with bubble bubbles, giving two to teammates, or the classic approach of one to yourself and one to a teammate. However, having both out at the same time is severely more punishing. Uh, I just have to wait double the time to get them back. I was just wondering if you guys give us some more insight. And okay, yeah. Uh, wait, was that answer? Yeah. Oh, okay. So first off, this isn't. This one actually doesn't really answer the whole idea between between both bubbles, um, stacking. I guess. Yeah, I get, okay, so this is where we disagreed, though, was even though, like, that puts you in a bad situation, yeah, but, like, the 80 charge is so nice to have, um, but not having bubbles again, like, it, I guess that wouldn't matter, like, even if you only bubbled yourself once and then bubbled somebody else, it would still put you in the same situation, so I don't know, I kind of, we talk. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go over it again, but I already disagreed with that, okay, I just think that maybe, it, maybe it missed out on the, Bubble yourself versus bubble teammate twice versus bubble yourself and your teammate. Um, was that the last one? No. Are you guys exhausted by all the rampant speculation based on an unpre unfinished preview? Real talk? Not even a little bit. Andy? Oh, man. Speculation and theory crafting is a result of an audience that deeply cares about the game we're making. We're stoked to see all of you discussing the gameplay from Overwatch League playtests. Thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. 
I'm so glad to hear that because, you know, I always get a couple comments on YouTube of people like, just leave it alone, dude. Like, stop being like, you know, stop Harvard on this. No! I love this shit. Glad to hear that, you know, it's liked that, you know, we want to keep speculating, keep talking, and and keep improving and try to like either give feedback whether it gets listened to or 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 gets like where you look at it and go wow that that's a take you know it's the chat answer yes that is the chat answer absolutely um is there any more it looks like it was the last one beautiful <sighs> i think that's a, that's a good place to end that anyways the chat answer from andy oh Never mind. But that was the Chad answer. I think that's a great place to end it.